Welcome to Body of Christ Ministries, where we're not a denomination, we're the Body of Christ. I'm Brother Glover, and I just want to say thank you to all the subscribers from the oldest to the newest. I've been meaning to say that on my last few videos. I, I've been gradually getting an increase in subscribers, and I just wanted to say thank you. I know all of y'all may not be on Facebook or Twitter or whatever, but nonetheless, you've come across my channel and and you know, maybe the good Lord led you to subscribe and be a part of it. So for that, I just want to say thank you. Um, before I get into the message, let me say this. I understand that there are critics and cynics who will refuse to hear truth and fresh revelation, not understanding that God unveils hidden truths from his word in these last days. Everyone is not going to agree with everything anyone says, but we don't have to be ugly about it. In spite of what others may think, I am sharing with those who are truly hungry for truth. Because of fresh revelation, I believe this will be my, one of my most profound teaching series on end times. Of course, until more fresh revelation is yielded by the Holy Ghost. Now, in one of my last videos, Identity of the Antichrist, towards the end, I said that I would do a video on the ranks of angels, according to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. But I feel like the Spirit is leading me to hold off on that until further notice, so I ask you would just bear with me. So as I'm beginning a new series, some of the teaching on the ranks of angels may be included in this series. I'm not completely through studying it, but I did get enough done to where I want to go ahead and record a part one. So anyway, this message will be part one of a new series I'm entitling Mysteries of the Last Days. I really hope the revelation from these studies will be a blessing to you and many others who will tune in at a later time. So without further delay, let me have a brief word of prayer and we'll get into this. Most heavenly, most precious heavenly father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you for this opportunity. I thank you for the downloads. I thank you for the studies and thank you for yielding fresh revelation. And I know that many, many of your people, many of your children, many of your students of the word and particularly students of Bible prophecy have been receiving quite a bit from you. So, Lord, I just want to let you know that it is an honor and a privilege to be able to share your word to people throughout the world via Internet. So, Father, I just pray that you would touch every heart and mind who will come across this video in the future. And I just pray that you would just. Bless them to listen and hear with an open mind, with an open spirit. And I ask that you will send people who are hungry for truth. So, Father, I give you honor, praise and glory. And I just pray that if there's anyone who happens to listen to this message or any of my videos and have not made that decision to accept Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior, I pray that before or by the end of this video that they will be convinced to give Jesus a chance as we pray the sinner's prayer. And Father, I just thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. The title of this series is Mysteries of the Last Days, and this is part one. And for a subtitle, the Lord gave me, A Shocking Event Precedes Chaos. Okay, and I'm going to break that down for you uh, as we get into this message. The theme scripture for this message series is going to be coming from Matthew chapter 24, verses 3 through 8. And this is part of the famous prophecy that Jesus told his disciples on the Mount of Olives. And these will be read in the King James Version unless I specify a different translation. And this is only signs before the end. Okay, Matthew chapter 24, beginning with verse 3 reads, and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, Jesus, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines, 
and pestilences and earthquakes in divers places or various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. So I want to focus on verses seven and eight to expound briefly, and then we'll get on into um, the shocking event that will precede chaos. And when I say chaos, that means the tribulation. Okay, on verse 8, when it says, nation shall rise against nation, and then it says kingdom against kingdom, this is not a redundant phrase. There is a specific difference from the Aramaic and Greek perspective in the first phrase that says, nation shall rise against nation, the proper translation should have been nationality against nationality because in most countries you have different cultures, especially here in America. You have multiple cultures living in the same country. And so nation against nation. Now, back in biblical times and a historical example of this would be the Jews and the Samaritans. And a perfect example would be when Jesus met with the Samaritan woman at the well. And you knew and you know from that particular passage that Jews and Samaritans had no dealings because the Samaritans were half breeds to just sum that up. So nation against nation basically is racism. OK, so when you have hatred between nationalities or ethnicities it's none other than racism and it's still going on today. So now when you look at this from a biblical or historical view. They went by tribes, and I know in other countries and nations, uh, they still go by tribes or ethnic groups or ethnicities, okay, or a group of people, a group of organized people, okay? So now, this goes way before the black and white thing, all right? Now, we have a current mess going on right now in America uh, in the midst of a pandemic, and, you know, we got the, you know, the white cop that killed the um, unarmed black man and then they got these load of protesters going on throughout the whole nation and then the protests have turned violent okay so now and then you got the black lives matter movement and then the black lives matter movement have been exposed by a lot of people so and i'm not going to get into that that's not what this message is all about i'm just giving you illustrations uh, we're talking about nation against nation now the most deadly part of this is going to come to where one particular organized group exterminates another group of people. Okay, it's called ethnic cleansing. Okay, prime example, when ISIS is out to destroy Christians and Jews. Okay, in history, you know about Hitler when he had six million Jews killed. Okay, his intention was to wipe out the Jewish race. Okay, so that's just a, another historical example. And the modern day example would be ISIS out to kill Christians and Jews. We know that's going on right now. Okay, so don't want to stay on it too long. Just wanted to give you an example of that. And then when it says kingdom against kingdom, that's when you have the nations fighting one another. Okay, so I just wanted to clarify this, that it's not a redundant phrase when it says nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Okay. Now, verse 8, it says, all these are the beginning of sorrows. Okay, from 70 AD, the destruction of the temple that Jesus prophesied in verses 1 and 2 of Matthew chapter 24, which I did not read. Okay, to the events happening now on up until the beginning of the tribulation. Every event occurring is the beginning of sorrows. We have not entered into the tribulation yet, as some people may be teaching about the seals and the trumpets and so forth. Okay. It's bad, but not nearly as bad as it will be once the restrainer is removed, according to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7. And I would encourage you to read that. I can't read every scripture reference, but I can tell you where it is, and hopefully you'll take the time to look it up in your own time. Okay, now let's talk about the shocking event that precedes chaos. And, and I told you earlier that chaos represents the tribulation. And... My method of teaching has been, I believe, since I first started, in the mouths of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. Jesus and Paul both said that. So I'm going to give you some scriptural proof text. Take it or leave it, but I'm going to back everything up with the word, okay? So some scriptural proof text of Jesus as the first witness, 
And Paul is the second witness sharing on the catching away of Christians, both the dead and alive in Christ. Okay, in John, the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, in the King James Version, this is talking about when Jesus will come again to receive us unto himself. And it reads, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Now, let's look at verse 3. Let's focus on three phrases here. First, Jesus said, I will come again. Okay, now this is referring to his first coming to the clouds. And then it says, and receive you unto myself. That's the catching away. That where I am, there ye may be also. What does this sound familiar with? This sounds familiar with the phrase in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17, which I will read here in a moment. Okay, but now let me read two similar passages that Paul wrote to two different groups of people. The first was in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 and 52. Well, actually, I put 53 down. But this is when he first revealed the mystery, okay, of the body of Christ transitioning into glorified bodies. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound. And the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Okay, so the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we which are alive and remain shall be changed, which I'm going to read to you in 1 Thessalonians. But let me point out something here in, in, in verse 52. When it says at the last trump, there's going to be a series of trumpets that will be sounding, but this is not the trumpets of the tribulation. A lot of people get that confused. I had a pastor asking me about that several weeks ago, and I had to explain to him that, no, this is not the same trumpets as the trumpets that will be blasted or sounded during the tribulation, okay? All right. And then verse 53 says, For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Now, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18 Okay, now here's your scriptural proof of the catching away of believers in Christ. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. This is him coming again to receive us unto himself. With the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up or snatched up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord now cross reference that with John chapter 14 verse 3 where it says that where I am there ye may be also okay verse 18 wherefore comfort one another with these words all right now let's go to the reasons as to why I believe in pre-tribulation rapture now, if you hadn't caught on by now, I'm referring to the rapture. And I know the Aramaic word is raptus, which means to catch up or snatch away. Okay, and, and, and we just read three scripture references where Jesus is coming to receive us unto himself. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Okay, now this is scripture, y'all. This is not Brother Glover, Brother Glover's philosophy. This is scripture, okay? Now... One thing we got to understand is judgment is for sinners, not for Christians who've repented and turned to God and away from the world. That's what you got to understand. When the New Testament makes reference to Old Testament, I believe it's still relevant for today. So my scripture passage is coming from 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 9. And this is, these are examples of God removing the righteous before judgment. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. See, sin is reserved for judgment. Verse 5, And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, 
bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them, them an ensample or example unto those that after should live ungodly, and delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked, for that righteous man dwelling among them, and seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations or tribulation, and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. So in other words, the godly will be delivered. Judgment is reserved for the unjust. That's basically what this scripture passage is saying. Okay, now let me give you three other scriptural examples of why believers will not go through the tribulation. Okay, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verses 9 and 10. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. So in other words, Christians have repented and turned to God. Verse 10, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. In other words, from the tribulation to come. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 8 through 10 reads, But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet the hope of salvation. For God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Now, this is another reference to John chapter 14, verse 3, and 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17, which we read earlier. And here's my last proof text on this particular subject. Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. Now, I'm not, not going to do this any justice about the seven churches because each church had its own particular significance. But this is regarding the church in Philadelphia. OK, because this is the only church that Jesus did not have to rebuke or tell to repent. It says, and I believe that believers in this day and age who are truly repentant in their hearts or, 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 or who live a repentant lifestyle is of this particular church of Philadelphia. Revelation chapter 3 verse 10 reads, and this is Jesus speaking, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from, not in, from the hour of temptation, that's the tribulation, y'all, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. And again, judgment is for the unrepentant sinners not Christians who have repented and turned from the world and turned to God. So out of the seven churches, this is the only church that Jesus did not rebuke. You know, the church is us individually, and this is the type of church we need to be. Now let's read 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 16 through 17, which will be one of my closing scriptures here. And it says, Yet, if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. But let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first began at us, not the building, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? So we know that this is referring to people. So now let me give you a brief summary here, and then I'm going to give some closing points. So in other words, after Christ returns, the first time to receive us unto himself. We can only imagine the uproar the world will be in. Then the man of sin will be revealed according to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7 again, and will present a peace solution to Israel according to Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. But it will be a counterfeit peace treaty. But somehow Israel will be deceived and fall for it. So in part two of this series, we will go into details on that. Now, in closing, before I pray, I have some concerns to express before I close and will speak, be speaking prophetically for the next few moments before I pray. I may lose some followers, but I believe I'm being led by the Spirit. 
According to Daniel chapter 2, verse 25, God removes kings and he sets up kings. I believe God has divinely chosen each president of the United States. Whether you're talking about Clinton, Bush, Obama, and now Trump. And for some reason, a lot of people don't want to accept that. But remember, God's thoughts, God's ways are higher than ours. Okay, so let me just kind of share a few insights as to what God is doing. And it's up to us to trust him and it's up to us to pray for these leaders rather than criticize or condemn them. Through Trump, God moved the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Trump has declared that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. He's defended the church. He's defended the womb or the unborn. He slowed down ISIS. When was the last time you heard of ISIS? And he has caused the unemployment rate for blacks and other minorities to its lowest in a long time. Now you might be asking, what is the significance about Jerusalem? What's the big deal about Jerusalem? Let, well, let me tell you, according to the scriptures, Zechariah chapter 2 verse 8 in the last part, God says that Jerusalem is the apple of his eye. Okay, in Psalm chapter 122 verse 6, specifically instructs us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They that love thee shall prosper. So that commandment comes with the promise of prosperity. He says that if you love Jerusalem, you will prosper. Now, I'm just going to just be straight edge. I'm just going to cut, shoot it to you straight going forward. Okay. And like I said, I'm speaking prophetically. I believe Trump will win his last term. And we better enjoy the next four years while they last. And we better not stop praying. It's not a matter of if, but when the Democrats, the leftists, and the deep state take over D.C. again, with the establishment pulling the puppet strings, I believe we will experience judgment and catastrophic events to an, such an extent that they will make this so-called COVID pandemic look like a comedy show. God will not apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah for letting us slide with abominations and lawlessness such as murdering babies. That's the shedding of innocent blood, y'all. Legalizing same-sex marriages, legalizing drugs, oppressing the poor, oppressing the widows, oppressing the orphans, racism and violence, America will be judged and many major cities will come, to, come under martial law. Now, I want to say this, and I feel led to say this. Pay attention to Ilhan Omar, which, by the way, have been married three times, and Rashida Tlaib, who are both Muslim senators, and they are both anti-Semitic. I believe they are forerunners of establishing martial law, as I believe President Obama was. There was a prophecy in the early 1900s that there would be a female president of the United States one day. Pay close attention to Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. I believe the establishment is grooming her to be of some type of high status in the political arena and may have aspirations to run for president in the near future. So just want to make you aware of some things. So be praying about stuff like this. You may be asking, well, brother, whose side are you on? And my answer, I'm on the right side. I'm on God's side. I'm not a Trump man. I'm a Jesus man. I'm not a Democrat. I'm not a Republican. I'm a man of God. I don't idolize any man in the office, in the Oval Office. I obey God's word that instructs me to pray for those in authority. And one last thing. These stay-at-home orders, which have now been lifted most places, has gotten many who were once regular church attenders out of the swing of attending church. And we must remember Hebrews 10, 25 tells us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. So let me share this. Separated sheep are open prey to the wolf. And we know the devourer is none other than Satan. So I just wanted to get this off my chest. But I do believe that this was something that the Holy Spirit had burning on the inside of me. I know a lot of people may be upset right now. Uh, so if you I meant to say before I got into my closing points, if you're one of those type of people that are super sensitive and easily offended, you might want to stop the video. But hey, I guess it's too late now. Maybe it wasn't meant for you to hear this. But anyway, listen, people, we we can't be we can't be afraid of the truth. We can't dummy down because we're afraid somebody's going to be offended 
whether it's co-workers, if your own family disowns you, you got to be so dedicated to God that you are willing to be disowned by your family if it means standing for truth. Amen, saints. Well, precious Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that this word has gotten through to people and I pray that they'll be hungry for part two. And I'm going to start studying as soon as I get another opportunity uh, amidst this work schedule that I'm on right now. But Father, most importantly, Lord, I pray that if there's anybody listening who may not be for sure where they stand, I just pray that right now they would just come to you sincerely by faith and just say, Father, I want to repent. I choose to turn from my wicked ways. Please forgive me of my sins and wash me with the blood of Jesus. I accept Jesus into my life. I believe that he died on the cross, that he shed his blood for the remission of my sins, and that he rose from the dead. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, saints, I know this video was a little longer than usual than what I've been doing lately. I've been trying to keep them to like 15 minutes to less than 20 minutes, but I really feel led. I mean, if you're hungry and you want this, you'll you'll stay there to the end. If not, just cut it off. It is what it is. But from here out going forward, I got to be led by the spirit. If it, even if it means people leaving, unfriending, unsubscribing, whatever it is, but I got to be bold in these last days. We're living in a day and age where it's too critical and too close to the end of time to be backsliding and playing around and having one foot in the world and one foot in the church. We either going to be hot or cold, not lukewarm. He said that he would spew us out of his mouth. As a matter of fact, that was a message to one of the churches in Revelation chapter 3. So make up your mind this day that you're going to be on fire for God. All right. Love you, saints. Please stay tuned for more messages. God bless.